Okay, hello, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm very, very thrilled uh, to be here tonight. Uh, as you know, we're going to be talking to Reed Brody, Judith Sargentini. Uh, Reed Brody has been working since the 1980s uh, to get our governments to implement uh, their commitments to human rights and justice through law. And Judith Sargentini uh, is a Dutch politician uh, who's also for years with great passion been working in the European, at the European level to get our union to implement the international development and human rights values that we've made central to our identity and to our laws. So I was thinking about this, while this is the night of dictatorship, what we're actually going to be talking about uh, for the next hour isn't so much how dictatorship works, uh, but rather how those who violate uh, human rights on a massive scale, the dictators, right, can be held accountable for what they do. Uh, the evening, the way I've envisioned it, I'm going to see a little bit how it goes, but the, you know, you start off with an idea of how something's going to go and then it can go in different directions, uh, is that the evening is in, the next hour is in three parts. Uh, in the very first part, I'll be uh, talking a little bit with uh, Reed Brody. I'll be introducing him a little bit more and then asking him some questions. And then after about 10 or 15 minutes, I'll be telling you a bit more about Judith Sargentini and I'll be bringing her into the conversation. We'll have a conversation for about 20, 25 minutes. And then we'll be opening up the floor for the final 10 minutes uh, for questions. I think if I look at you, I can imagine that we might have more questions than we have time for. I think the time anyway tonight is gonna go very, very fast. Uh, but I'll try and take a few questions at the end, the final 10 minutes. Um, Reed Brody, your counsel, your spokesman for Human Rights Watch, and for many years now, you've been really on the cutting edge of working to create institutions and precedents for bringing dictators to justice. And I think that's one of the things that's very interesting is to precisely how your work has been taking place at the cutting edge, where things are being developed that did not exist some years earlier. You began in the 1980s reporting on Nicaragua to the point that the U.S. funding for the Contras was ended. It created such a scandal right, that that funding had to be ended. You later lobbied the U.N. to be tougher on governments in Haiti, Iraq, and Indonesia. You worked with Mongolia to develop an effective democratic constitution. And I think that starts to show also the range of your experience. You've challenged secret U.S. prisons and the mistreatment of detainees during the war on terror. And you helped to persuade the British House of Lords to strip Pinochet of his immunity, which led to his trial. And I think you've doggedly, right, with conviction and persistence, challenged a veritable who's who of global dictators. And I think it's very nice to mention a number of these, not just Pinochet in Chile, also Jean-Claude Duvalier of Haiti, Alfredo Stroessner of Paraguay, Pol Pot of Cambodia, Suharto of Indonesia, Saddam Hussein of Iraq, and Omar al-Bashir of Sudan. So I've seen, right, a number of times, you might have even been advertised, I think, for this talk, right, as the dictator hunter. Uh, the di yes, Reed Brody, the dictator hunter. And so let me just start with that kind of a question. Uh, how did you become this, a dictator hunter? Well, I mean, it, it's a lovely title, and it, it, it's, you know, it, 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 um, but it, I, it doesn't really, I think, translate the the, the, the serious and constructive work I do um, with victims who are seeking to, uh, who are seeking justice. Uh, but it began in, the, you mentioned the Pinochet case, and um, in 1998, um, a couple of months after the International Criminal Court was voted on in Rome, in October 1998, um, the dictator, a former dictator of Chile, Augusto Pinochet, was arrested in London on a warrant from a Spanish judge for crimes committed or allegedly committed uh, 15 years earlier in Chile. And um, uh, we, I, I, I ran to London for, on behalf of Human Rights Watch where we were admitted together with Amnesty International um, because Pinochet immediately challenged his arrest and said, you can't arrest me. Um, I was a former head of state, I have immunity. And we realized that this was really going to be a cutting edge. This was this, you know, just coming back from Rome. We realized this, this was what the world could start to look like. And 
Um, we we spent uh, several months at the House of Lords. Uh, so Pinochet challenged his arrest before the courts. It went up to what was then the Supreme Court of, Eng of England and Wales, the House of Lords. And the House of Lords ruled that under international law, under the, the, the UN Torture Convention, um, Pinochet could be uh, arrested anywhere in the world, um, despite his status as a former head of state. And... Uh, you know, that was a, I mean, I described that for as much to the delight of the press people at Human Rights Watch as, as a wake-up call for dictators. Um, but what it really was, was a, a ray of hope for activists around the world. And it, it's, hard, it's hard to overemphasize the, the, the effervescence in the human rights movement with the arrest of Pinochet. And this was a case that was brought by Chilean exiles in Spain. And then we started really to see, you know, how could we use this tool of international justice to bring to book, um, you know, tyrants and torturers who seemed out of the reach of justice. And that's how all these other cases began. And the Chadians and other people started coming to us and saying, what about Straussner, who's there? And what about um, Idi Amin? And what about, and, and you know, m most of the cases I've worked on, I have to say, failed miserably. Um, but some of, them have, some of them have succeeded. Yeah, and why do you think that, what changed, right? What, why, because we've had many, many dictators. We have atrocious violations of human rights. Um, what changed that suddenly this was possible when it well, hadn't been it, possible it, it, before? It was possible in London. I mean, the laws are that the laws have not changed. What, what, mm -hmm. what, what counts in, in the Pinochet case and in each of the other cases that I've worked on or tried to work on is, is generating the political will, the political conditions to make it happen. I mean, Pinochet had been to Holland, by the way, the year before he went to London. And he, he left, he would, no, I mean, there were Dutch activists who tried to get him arrested, but he wasn't arrested. Mm -hmm. and, and the question is, and I'm sure, you know, if he had gone to other countries, uh, which, he, which he was, I mean, it was, England wasn't the only country he visited, um, but what had happened, well, first of all, you had, the case was in Spain, and you had in Spain a huge political consensus around Chile. People knew who Pinochet was. There was a strong, and, and you had a judge, Baltazar Garzón, who was very active. Um, the Spanish, the conservative Spanish government had no desire to have this happen. But the Spanish public because of its affinities, because so many Chilean exiles were living in Spain, were very much in favor. Pinochet went to London, as he had each year when Margaret Thatcher was the prime minister, but this time Tony Blair was the prime minister. Mm -hmm. And whatever we may think about Tony Blair in retrospect, at the time he had just been elected and was promising a, 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 an ethical foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And so Pinochet comes, the, the Spanish asked for his extradition, and it became a huge political issue in, in, in England. But it was something that Tony Blair, as he was moving to the center and to the right, could give to, the, to, to, to his supporters and say, you know, in fact, his, his Peter Men David Mendelssohn, what's his name? Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn said, you know, this is, this is you know, he said, this is, this is you know, the, the, the Labour Party, Margaret Thatcher, the, the party of the dictators and Pinochet and people like that. So it's a question of political will. Each of these cases, even, I mean, while Pinochet was, was, was in detention, um, we were approached by, um, I was approached by, by a group of, 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 of South Asians who had been expelled from Uganda, who wanted us to go after Idi Amin, who is now in Saudi Arabia. Right. Okay, we went to see the Saudi ambassador. The Saudi, of course, Sa Saudi Arabia has, had ratified the same torture convention that, 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 that the UK had that requires that people like Idi Amin be extradited or prosecuted. And the Saudi ambassador said to us, said, you don't understand Bedouin hospitality. When we allow somebody into our tent, we can't ask them questions, which happens according to Ginny Sherry, who my colleagues will know from Human Rights Watch, actually not to be true under Bedouin mm -hmm. hospitality. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and, and there were other cases like that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I could go, I could list right. some of them, but. Well, because I want, because there's, I, I want to quickly, before we uh, bring in Judith, um, I want to see where you ended up most recently right. with Chad. But I think what you're saying here, I think this is maybe one of the things that we'll keep coming back to 
this evening potentially, right, is that you have a lot of laws on the books. But there's a, a certain amount of luck and arbitrariness, right, in whether or not they're implemented, how they're implemented. And some of the time, you know, as your career's made clear, that has allowed you to achieve things that have not been achieved before, mm -hmm. even as at the same time, it makes it very difficult to keep repeating those successes. I think in terms of successes, right, where, where I'd like you to uh, maybe still say a little bit is uh, the case that I've seen described sometimes is, is your biggest success. I don't know if that's how you experience it, right? But uh, you had the dictator, the former dictator of Chad, um, Hissan Habre. He was uh, in power from 1982 to 1990. Um, there's different figures I've seen on the internet in terms of the, the impact that he had on his people. What I've seen uh, from, from uh, Chad organizations is that 40,000 were killed, up to 200,000 were tortured. Um, he was deposed in a coup in 1990, right? And since then there was activism to bring him to justice. You became involved in that, and then eventually he was convicted 2015, I believe. It was upheld 2016, and this was a tremendous, tremendous success. And I wonder if maybe you could say a little bit about that, uh, which is maybe your most recent uh, success. Sure. Well, well, as we were looking around for the next Pinochet, um, uh, uh, so, uh, Really what happened is that we were approached by Chadian activists who said, you know, who looked at, who were inspired as we were by the, by the Pinochet case and said, and, and a Chadian activist came to us and Delphine Jaib, and she said, we want to do that. Can you help us do that? And, um, you know, there was a group of survivors and I won't give you, it's 18, I worked on the case for 18 years, so I won't give you the whole, <laughs> the whole story, but um, essentially, um, we worked with them um, to tell their stories, um, and f the case, bound, the case went to. We filed the case in Senegal. Senegal threw the case out. We went to Belgium. We can't, the, Vic, the Belgian law of universal jurisdiction was repealed, but uh, then it went to the African Union. It went back to Senegal. Um, I think the, the 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 tagline here is that victims came together, created. By, by campaigning around the world, created a, enough pressure on the African Union and Senegal um, so that uh, in 2012, the International Court of Justice in The Hague uh, ordered Senegal to prosecute Habre. Um, the new president of Senegal, um, who, 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 we, who was one of the many people that we had um, lobbied together with the victims over those years, um, agreed to establish a court. Um, and as, as you say, I mean, Habre, Habre, Habre was prosecuted. Um, it was a case, and, and I think this is the singularity of the Pinochet case, of the Habre case, of cases like the dictator Rios Mont in Guatemala, um, is that these are cases that are driven by the victims, mm -hmm. not by an international court. Um, and the victims were really the, drove the narrative of this case. And when each time it looked like we were going to, something was going to happen, for instance, when the Belgians were going, repealed the law on universal jurisdiction, because there were, everybody was being sued in Belgium, Sharon and Arafat and George Bush and everybody. Suleiman Gengeng, one of the survivors who, who really this case is the symbol of this case, a man who, as people were dying around him in his and Habre's jails, took an oath before a very religious man that if he ever got out, he would fight for justice. Mm -hmm. And he, he went to the Belgian, he went to the head of the legal commission, met with the farm minister, looked at them and said, wait a second, you know, we, we've been fighting for years. We, we went to Senegal, uh, they threw us out. We came to Belgium, a Belgian judge started investigating. Um, we thought that you were going to give us justice. And now you're telling us no, because of George Bush, we can't, you know, have justice. And, and I remember the president of the, of the legal commission, the, La Commission des Lois in Belgium, no, 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 Mr. Gang Gang, no, 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 we'll find a way to save your case. And so when the law was repealed, it was repealed in a way that allowed the Chadian case to continue. Mm. And because of that activism, we had in Belgium an interparliamentary committee, Walloons and Flemish, uh, socialists and conservatives, in favor of this case. And so then when Senegal didn't move the case forward, 
um, the victims went back to Belgium and said, now you have to take another step. And Belgium took Senegal to the International Court of Justice. And so it was a case really driven by the victims in which the entire trial, you know, many, I'm sorry, I know I'm taking time, but, you know, in, in, in the International Criminal Court, and we have Titska Lingsman who's written a book about the International Criminal Court here, but, you know, millions of people have been killed in the Congo. Mm -hmm. The International Criminal Court gets involved and decides that it's going to pursue that warlord over there and that warlord over there, and that's it. The vic when the victims are in the driver's seat and the victims are deciding what the case is about, they say, no, you have to make sure that the Muslim victims, that the Christian victims, that these victims, that that. And it's a very different kind of justice that results, whether it be the dictator of Guatemala tried before the Guatemalan people or the dictator of Chad tried as a result of the Chadian victims. Yeah, and I think that's a very interesting point, especially if we, see, if we bring in Judith now, who's, who's working very actively in Europe, um, addressing a number of these issues, but from a bit of a different angle. Um, and so where I wanted to start, because initially, say, the idea had been, because uh, Judith has a lot of experience with Africa, um, to start with, uh, just to tell you more generally, right, she worked, uh, after she went to university, she worked in an NGO that was fighting the trade in conflict diamonds. Since 2009, you've been uh, a member of the European Parliament, where you're a coordinator in different committees that are very much committed to uh, issues of civil liberties, justice and affairs. That's one committee. Another one, the Committee for Development, also the Committee for Human Rights. You've been very visible, um, at least you know, within my space, uh, working on behalf of migrants and refugees within Europe also. Right? You, you're known to have said Europe uh, should be a home. It should not be a fortress. Uh, and at the same time, even as you've been quite active uh, in that field, you've also have a long uh, history of relations uh, and engagement with Africa on the ground. You're a member of the delegation that maintains relations with South Africa, the delegation that has relations with the Pan-African Parliament. Uh, you've done a lot of work on uh, development and you were in Chad uh, <laughs> itself earlier just this year. And um, so now I'll tell you in terms of discussions possibly going in different directions. So the idea had been, let's talk about uh, Chad. She's telling us what right? to do. <laughs> well, no, I'm leaving it open to you. I'm leaving it, I'm opening the door to you, right? Because the, the idea had been really to see, you know, what your take was um, on Chad. I think I'd really, I'd like to see that. But at the same time, I know that Judith, uh, just last week, uh, she was engaged within the European Parliament. She initiated the procedure uh, with Within the parliament, right, that is necessary to take away the vote of Hungary in the council uh, on the basis of developments that are taking place in Hungary right now, which are undermining democracy, undermining uh, the commitments to human rights that we have within Europe. So I think the, the issue, right, that, that's right in front of you is this strong engagement right now within the European context. Um, and I think the, there's a number of questions that come up in terms of political will. Exactly. And so, yeah, so I'd like to kind of leave it up to you, okay. you know, because you have that direct experience just a few months earlier in Chad, maybe to talk about, you know, what have you seen of the impact of this great achievement in Chad on the ground when you were there? Um, but Should we talk about political will for a sec? I'd be happy to. Because I think that's the thing. The two examples you're giving are great. They're, I mean, very inspiring. But uh, these, are, these were dictators that were ousted or left and were in exile. Uh, whereas there are a lot of um, uh, dictators or, uh, or authoritarian leaders that are still there and that are actually being ignored or even protected. Uh, yes, I was in Chad. And actually, a couple of months before that, just before the elections, I was in the Gambia. Um, uh, and what you, those are, uh, well, Chad is a police state. Uh, and it's still, it's still not great, uh, but we're absolutely looking away because Chad is a country surrounded by uh, very, even more uh, conflictuous countries, Niger, Nigeria, uh, uh, Libya in the north, Central African Republic in the south, uh, and Darfur, Sudan in the, uh, in, in the east. So, and Chad sees itself as a stabilizer of the region. They've spent, they spend an awful lot of money on their defense, uh, uh, 
uh, their police, uh, their military. They have blue helmets for the UN in all kinds of places. And when it comes to that, I think you could say they're doing actually very good work. But we're ignoring uh, the state of uh, the, the rule of law and the state of, of the, the country is in when it comes to democracy because they're uh, uh, playing the role of stabilizer in the region. We're looking away, which means that the, the country can continue on this road and you, you don't know what will come from that. And another example is the whole uh, debate around uh, countries in the uh, north of Africa. Uh, um, uh, the speaker earlier uh, this afternoon, this evening, spoke about uh, uh, countries and the uh, what was then called Arabic Spring. Well, let's take Egypt. Mubarak is ousted. There are elections. Morsi wins. Morsi is representing the Muslim uh, Brotherhood. Uh, not particularly friendly party, but and uh, not my type of guy. But he was elected. Morsi is trying to function. I have actually been with an official delegation to, uh, to Cairo uh, with, uh, with then uh, Lady Ashton, who was leading the European External Action Service, to talk about development and cooperation and democracy, which was really kind of a strange situation uh, with uh, President Morsi, but we were there. Half a year later, there's a coup d'etat. Uh, by Sisi, who is now the president. I, I would call him Mubarak 2.0. It was a coup d'etat against a leader that was elected in that country. And there was nobody in Europe that wanted to use the word coup d'etat. We had a debate in the European Parliament. I was, the, I was doing the debate for the European Greens. I was the only one using coup d'etat. The rest was actually happy that this Muslim brother, Brotherhood leader was ousted and that Sisi was installing some sort of a... Well, a, 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 he was more secular, they thought, and it would uh, uh, improve the relationship between us and Egypt, Egypt, the, the country that needs to stabilize again a region and could be there uh, in a region that gets more and more terrorism and Islamic uh, fundamentalism uh, and uh, etc. So again, we are looking at Egypt not as a country where citizens are entitled to democracy or rule of law, but we're looking at it from a geopolitical perspective and we change our tune. First, we, we ignored Ben Ali, uh, we had the deals with, with uh, Gaddafi, uh, we, we financed uh, Mubarak because they stabilized the region. Then we cheered them on for the Arabic Spring. That was great. You uh, got yourself rid of these dictators. And then we changed our tune again. Political mm -hmm. will is an issue. Final example, not only European a problem with a yeah. lack of political will. Al Bashir from Sudan was visiting South Africa, uh, what is it, one and a half, two years ago. He's on the sanctions list. Whenever he goes somewhere, somebody should arrest him and bring him to the ICC in The Hague. South Africa let him go. Things like that right. make dictators continue to work. And then 15 years after they step down, you come after them. <laughs> I like that. But are we actually, how are we going to get this process faster? Yeah, because, because, Reed, how do you see that? I mean, because if I, if I, you know, I read up, I read a list of some of your um, achievements, some of the dictators you've been chasing after, um, and it sounds like so much has been achieved, and it's taken, you know, a half a lifetime of work, right? So you've invested your heart and soul. There's many, many people you're working with who've risked a lot, who've invested tremendously. Um, so it sounds like significant steps have been set. But then you listen to Judith, right? And it sounds like, first of all, there's so much more. What, what is left to do, right, <laughs> is so much more than what has been achieved. But also that what has been achieved just depends on fate, right? You, you, the luck of the draw. So, you know, you have 50 dictators. And then it depends on who's willing to support you in tracking down one or two or three of them. But Do I you would see not call it like that? that? Faith, eh? I think that is a lack of political will or somewhere a little bit of political will. Because faith sounds much too... No, it's fate which dictator gets chased. Because that's what I'm curious no, about I mean, is, is, I mean, it's very clear. You know, Reid was telling us what are the specific circumstances with Pinochet 
or the specific circumstances uh, with Avré, right? But in each case, there's very specific circumstances. But if you look at the total picture, it looks like it's a matter of luck, which few dictators are actually prosecuted and which ones, you know, have, you know, the political protection that they're not, you know, is it a matter of luck? Which of the dictators well, you know, are going to get prosecuted? I mean, it, no, it's a matter of, I think it's a matter of political will. I mean, I think Judith is right. I mean, you know, Hissen Habre was mm -hmm. supported by the West. He was brought to power by Ronald Reagan, um, first covert operation of the Reagan administration before the Contras and Nicaraguans of Vimby and Angola. Um, and the West, the West supported Habre because he was the anti Gaddafi. And 25 years later, the West is supporting Idris Deby in Chad for the same reasons that Judah said, because he's our, he's our battleship in, 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 in a very dangerous region. Um, I think, and you know, the tools, the, the prosecutorial tools that are in the hands of activists only work against former dictators. It's true. I mean, um, uh, uh, but, but, you know, the thing is that it, it is what, what we do. First of all, what we do is accessible. So just as the Chadians came to us and said, we want to do that. Now the hope and that the reality is that people are coming to us and seeing what the Chadians did and say, we want to do that too. And in fact, we, you mentioned the Gambia. I was just, I, I organized a meeting between the Habre's victims of Chad and the Gambian victims of Yahya Jami, and now they are starting the road to bringing Jami back and bringing him to just, so it's an accessible tool. But you mentioned the, 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 the I mean, I think the ICC, the only people who can go after sitting heads of state are the ICC, and I, I think, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's certainly a hard slog, but what I feel the ICC does not do and, and you described the, the moment when al-Bashir was in South Africa and there was a question of whether he should be arrested. It, it, it got played out, as the ICC often does, as, as an ideological dispute between the international prosecutor and the Security Council and an African head of state. What was missing when, in that whole incident was, was the voice of the Darfuri victims. Mm -hmm. And that is what creates the political will. I mean, if you say to an African person, uh, who do you want, who are you in favor of, the prosecutor or the president? Well, that's, but who are you in favor of? The man who's come out of the dungeon or the guy who threw him in the dungeon? And, and that's when you start to create, and I think the ICC really misses the boat when it does not ally itself with the victims. And, and when the prosecutor really, um, you know, makes decisions based, based on, you know, whatever, pro tactical, prosecutorial reasons or political reasons. And it, it's a very distant kind of theoretical justice often. Right. And, and how there's different ways that it could be explained. Right. So uh, one of the things, for example, we talked about and it in its sort of in, in the story you're telling, not quite, but one could see it in there. Right. Is is the question of of the relations about which dictators are prosecuted. There's been a common complaint coming from Africa, which has led uh, some African countries to be interested in or actually step out of the ICC. Right. Because there's a sense that when push comes to shove, which are the dictators who get prosecuted, for whom is there the political will? It's the African yeah, But there's a very yeah. practical argumentation yeah. behind that, eh? mm -hmm. um, and that is African countries, bless them, signed up to the ICC, whereas Americas, the US still didn't, and a lot of Asian countries have not done so either. So. Um, this, there are, by the way, a, a possibility. ICC is trying to uh, to also look into the Assad Syria case, where Syria had not signed up to the ICC. Mm -hmm. So I, I understand where that emotion comes from. Part of it is because they've been such good peoples or good governments at that point, signing up to it, where a lot of Asian countries have not. And how do you see that? Uh, because you wrote a book saying that George W. Bush, right? should be brought to justice. Um, the U.S. has been tremendously resistant to any notion of having its citizens right, stand trial. There's a plan to invade The Hague, should any American end up being on trial in The Hague. 
do you see that? Uh, you know, do you share Judith's analysis that it's just simply a matter, a practical matter of which countries signed up to the ICC? Or is there oh, something I mean, else? I, I mean, there's, it's clear that there is a double standard at, 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 at work here. Um, the problem is certainly not that the, that, I mean, all of the African cases before the ICC are, are meritorious. I mean, Darfur is like a no-brainer. I mean, it, it's, it's one of the great atrocities of, of our generation. The problem is that when, that, that the countries, either the United States, not just the United States, but Russia, China, countries that um, have, are on the Security Council are basically protected off from the hook. Uh, off the hook as well as the countries who are protected by them so the united states protects israel russia and and china protect uh, sri lanka and syria and north mm -hmm. korea um and yes i mean yeah you know i'm not comparing what george bush did to what to darfur but george bush authorized torture um he authorized waterboarding he sent people to um, to, to Egypt under Mubarak, to Libya under Gaddafi, to, to Sir, Syria under Assad, in order to be interrogated and tortured. Um, this is the textbook definition of torture. Um, and if we say, you know, that the United States can get away with torture, then it makes it easier, you know, for, for then we basically, you know, when, when, I'm sorry, but when Sudan commits torture, it's kind of, we expect that. But when the United States brags about committing torture, then the entire international system that we're talking about gets debased. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it, it also undermi I mean, undermines the architecture of international justice. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's very easy for a Sudanese leader or a Zimbabwean to say, oh, well, why don't you do, I mean, it, it's, it's not the answer, but it's a very easy, easy toss off. And I think we in the West have an obligation. I mean. You know, we called on Barack Obama to prosecute uh, Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld and Ten. Uh, clearly, he was not going to do it. I worked with other NGOs on cases that were filed in France, in Germany, in Spain, on Guantanamo, on the secret prison. In each of these European democratic countries, the government, in one way or another, intervened because politically it was too difficult to have these cases move forward. Yeah, because, Judith, I'm wondering, for, for somebody like you, I mean, your, your commitments are very clear. Um, and at the same time, you're a European politician uh, who's embedded, right, within a much larger structure. Would it be possible for a European politician like yourself to publicly express support for that kind of a project to bring American leaders to justice? I guess uh, it would be possible, but okay. we're here at the would night of the that? night of the dic of Nacht van de Dictatuur, yeah. and and I, um, I would not call George Bush a dictator. Uh, so I'm choosing to I'm choosing uh, to to go after different goals. We did try, by the way, as European Parliament, to go after the uh, uh, the uh, CIA rendition flights, rendition flights uh, where whether there were people uh, in secret uh, prison in Europe, in Poland, for instance, that were then off on to Guantanamo Bay. We tried. It leads nowhere because there's, again, no political will uh, in Europe to, uh, to actually go off that because the fight against uh, terrorism... Um, um, well, and there, there comes a debate around dictatorship. The fight against terrorism um, uh, legalizes, morally legalizes, things like uh, the, uh, the CIA rendition flights. At least that is not what I'm saying, but that's how, it, how it's perceived. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm looking, and I'm using this bridge now, I'm looking towards uh, targeting uh, those countries that have a sliding rule of law, a backsliding rule of law. Uh, and when it comes to uh, what Europe can do and where we're looking ahead or looking away, I think Poland and Hungary are two examples right now uh, where it is difficult to drill up the political will to, to say what is going on in a country like Poland, where uh, the government uh, pretty soon now will be the one source that can appoint a judge and whether you should doubt whether the court cases in Poland are still fair.
-hmm. or a country like uh, Hungary that from one day to another closes newspapers and uh, and brings uh, ju again judges uh, to an early retirement. Um, again there, what's the state of, of rule of law and are we willing to see it and act upon it? I, it's kind of difficult to be uh, to be um, very uh, principled uh, towards, say, Chad or towards uh, George Bush in the U.S. if we're looking away what's happening very close to home. But just uh, this will be the last time I put pressure on you <laughs> in this way. Um, but I mean, if you weigh, for example, a government um, creating censorship the way you're seeing the example that you were just giving, relative to a government um, invading other countries without the support of the international community, the UN and so forth, and then in the process formally legalizing for itself uh, the use of torture, right? Isn't torture, doesn't that go a number of levels farther than censorship? I don't think you, you, you can simplify the situation in Hungary or in Poland uh, to censorship. Sure. Uh, and, and I don't like to do this weighing, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm, just, I'm just not willing to say here that this would be the right case for me to take on. Because sure. uh, my choice is not, is not going after George Bush now in the US. My choice is to look what I can do with Africa and what I can do in, uh, in the European Union. But I'm not going to weigh here which, uh, which sort of break of the rule of law is worse mm -hmm. without... Yeah, I'm not just simply not going to do that. How is that for you? Because that's political reality. Absolutely. Right? How is that for <laughs> well, you? Well, uh, no, I, you know, I think when, when an American president... I mean, I have to say that in ret I would be willing to drop the charges against George Bush. To get it. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's, you know, what we, what we are facing now in the United States, incredibly, is so much worse than George W. <laughs> so much worse than George Bush. Um, in what way? How, because this is right. Well, the I mean, we I, just, yeah, how I mean, do you weigh I think, things? Uh, how well, do you weigh Trump well, first of all, it's now. Bush. Trump is now. And I think, I exactly. think, I think that, um, we are engaged in the United States in a battle for the soul of the republic. I mean, you know, I, I think, I mean, I, I'm quite actually at the moment optimistic that, that the republic will survive Donald Trump if assuming that global warming and, and nuclear war doesn't get to us first. Um, but, you know, I, I've been incredibly impressed by, by the resistance in the United States. Um, uh, and, but, you know, Trump, given, I mean, if, if Trump had his way, he would be a dictator. I mean, the only reason he's not a dictator is because so far the American people have resisted that. Um, and, and he is and, only there for, what is it, 100 days, 140 so, days? So, so far, but, you know, I think, that, frankly, the fact that in January that people came out on the streets on January 21st in the Women's March, that people came out to the airports right after the, the travel ban, um, that people besieged the congressional offices when he tried to take away their health care. Um, I mean, obviously, he can do a, a huge amount of damage with the stroke of the pen and by, 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 by legitimating Nazis and, 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 and racism. Um, and by, by with, the, you know, with the stroke of a pen, putting 800,000 lives in, 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 in danger. Um, but the fact is that this is regarding the repeal, his uh, repeal of DACA, the, the protection that's provided to young immigrants who came when they were minors to the United States. And so under Obama, right, they were given um, a, a procedure was put in place where they could get two years of residency and work permits. And now uh, Trump has um, ended that. And that means that there's 800,000 uh, young immigrant Americans who don't know if they're going to be able to keep living in the United States. So that's the um, but, you know, I mean, it, you know, I'm obviously this is not over and, and Trump has going to possibly name future Supreme Court judges, um, which I shudder to think. And 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 but right now there is, you know, the. That's the struggle that we're involved in in the United States, and, but, and it's but now. What I find problematic there is that 
uh, there's been a gerrymandering going on, so yes. a, a re redefining election districts yes, in absolutely. order for the right vote to come out, right. uh, and and that's been that's not new on the Trump. That's been going on for a very long time, and you can I, you can. Pre predict that continuing, which makes it more and more difficult than the, 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 uh, the, um, uh, the balance between uh, the amount of votes you're getting in the amount of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, seats you're getting in, uh, in Congress is, or is getting completely out of balance. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, you're actually creating a system that continuously sees men like Trump being elected. And if I can bring this back again to a European debate, we've got elections in Hungary coming up in May. Uh, and uh, Viktor Orban is going to win those elections. Uh, not only because the system has changed over the years and the gerrymandering has been going on, also because opposition is in disarray and it would really be nice if they get themselves together. But the longer a, 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 a leader is in place and the more he or she can maneuver him or herself in such a way, it's getting more and more difficult to get these people uh, voted down because you get into an incredibly legalized debate where they say we're sticking to the rules yeah, but they made the rules because they recently changed the rules in such a way that it would help them and that I find a f a very um, uh, frightening and that actually comes to a debate around a dictatorship or around uh, a sliding backwards in your rule, rule of law how come we see that happening Mm -hmm. And we let that happen. Yeah, and I th yeah, and now we're getting into we, we've essentially we've come to the the, yeah. the end, and we're coming up to the next topic in a way of democratically legitimated dictatorships uh, or dictator type regimes or regimes that have aspects of dictatorships. Um, so we know that you know you're working very very hard now to uh, to to do something about that. Working also within the sets of laws and rules that you have uh, in the European Parliament. Um, and let me just finish by asking uh, what project I'm going to open up to the floor. You guys can be thinking about what kinds of questions you have and maybe you can say what's the project that right now you're uh, working on. Where are you going from here? Well, I guess, I mean, I'm doing two things. I'm, I'm, I'm working with, with the Gambian victims right. um, on, uh, on, on helping them get organized, helping them fight for, 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 um, for compensation for, uh, and, and ultimately to bring Yaya Jame to justice. Um, in the United States, um, and I think this is equally important to what is, is that I feel like I'm part of the resistance and, and I'm very active on, on a local level in, 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 Brooklyn, in, Brooklyn? in Brooklyn where yeah. I live um, with organizations that are fighting against um, the, the, the destruction of the American Constitution and, 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 and a pluralist um, diverse country in America. And I think that we all, and I say this to Europeans, um, it's really important not to legitimize Donald Trump and to treat him like the, the to treat him like the man he is and, 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 and not to give in and, and to, to speak out. I mean, Europeans should be, I mean, I know Europe, Europe has its own issues on immigration, but Europe should be speaking out on the, the, the Muslim travel ban. It should be speaking out on DACA when, when, when I mean, as many European leaders have done. When they meet Americans, when they meet American officials, they should not treat American officials like the Americans they knew before. They should treat American officials like representatives of the current regime in the United States, which would be a dictatorship. I mean, this is a regime that talks about the press as enemies of the people. It talks about so-called judges. Um, if, 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 if Donald Trump were president of Hungary, it would be much worse. That's the next debate. Okay. Who's worse, Trump or Orban? Well, I'm uh, trying to get a two-third majority in the European <laughs> Parliament to start a process that takes voting rights away uh, possibly voting rights away from Hungary, which means I have to show that this is not a, a all incidents, but it's a systemic um, um, right. down going of, of the rule of law and democracy. So I, I would try and refrain from words like that because I need a lot of people to vote <laughs> with me. <Okay. laughs> 
Okay. Uh, well, on that, let me uh, see who in the audience has questions. Like I'd mentioned, we've got 10 minutes. It'll be to, okay, I see a hand back there. Uh, microphones on the floor. And I'd like you to try and keep your questions right focused so we can get as many questions as possible. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I have a question for Mr. Brody, who said that the West has an obligation. Um, he said that in between a few other sentences, and I'm not sure what he means by that or what the basis for that obligation is. The obligation to do what? Well, to prosecute dictators and to basically maintain law and order in the rest of the world. Um, first of all, I mean, even though it's the night of the dictators, and I seem to have gotten this name, the dictator hunter, um, you can be a dictator and not torture, and you can be a torturer and not be a dictator. Exactly. So, I mean, I'm not really, I mean, George Bush, I, I never said that George Bush was a dictator. He was a democratic elected president of the United States. But he authorized torture. Um, and I think that, you know, we have a rules, I mean, we hope, I think, all to achieve a rules-based international system um, in, w in which governments respect the rights of their citizens. And when someone commits genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, torture, um, there is a obligation under international law um, that th these people be prosecuted, um, whether they are George Bush or whether they are Omar el-Bashir. And, and, and I say the West has an obligation in the sense that we are privileged enough to have some say over how our governments behave. And our, our government, whether it's the Dutch government or, or the American government, should be the expression of what our people believe. And, and I, I, I'm sure everybody in this room believes in, in, those, in those principles of, of the rule of law. So that's, that's, I guess, what I was saying. Okay, next question. Yes, I was wondering if you guys have any hope for the ICC, or is it a structure that really needs to change in order to be effective once more? Um, first of all, I mean, I think what the most important thing to me about the ICC is that it exists and that it, it, it translates the, it, it's the embodiment of the international commitment to those principles. And I don't believe that the work that I've done on the Hisson Habre case or on the other case would be possible if we did not have that international commitment. Um, that said, I mean, first of all, I don't think that we can expect that the ICC somehow, that, there, that you have the international kind of the correlation of forces here, and the ICC is going to be able tomorrow to start prosecuting Americans and Russians and Chinese. Um, I mean, it's not. It, um, I do think that it can be, that, that the ICC as an institution can be more effective um, if it allies itself, as I was talking about before, with the victims, if it takes a much more, um, uh, I mean, I thought when the ICC was set up, I, I mean, I was skeptical that there would be a lot of cases, but that when there was a case, they would prosecute like 50 people in the country, not like just like at Nuremberg, not just like one person. I thought like the entire regime, everybody would be, and I think that, would, that in itself would have, a, you know, a much, a much greater impact. Um, you know, we prosecuted Hissen Habre for 10, I mean, the court that prosecuted Hissen Habre cost $10 million. There the you IC, go. The, it sounds like a lot of money, but the ICC is like a billion. Um, and so, you know, obviously that kind of comes with the nature of an interna international institution that tries to, has this aspiration for procedural f perfection. But I would say don't try uh, throw away the baby with the bathwater. Uh, and those that are critiquing the ICC have something to hide. And the whole debate in the African Union, the countries that are most aggressive towards the ICC definitely have something to hide. Think Burundi. And the Gambia wanted out, but then... Uh, 
surprise, surprise, I had what came as a, a very positive shock, uh, the opposition won in the Gambia and they changed their tune. South Africa wants out, but South Africa at the moment has a very disturbed way of looking at itself uh, and, uh, and at the international society. Um, it's, it's a very strange thing to see that the ANC government uh, uh, wants to get out of the ICC. It is not shared over the board. So those that I mean, there's a lot you can say that needs improvement, but there's a lot that we need to cherish. It's there, and every time a country says, uh, or a group of uh, politicians says, it's wrong and they are uh, prejudiced, what's the reason behind that is what I would like to understand. Uh, no, I just, I, I mean, I would say that the answer to a lot of the problems is to, is to, is to put pressure on the United States and other countries to ratify the ICC. I mean, Judith pointed out the problem. I mean, some countries haven't ratified. Yeah, and I think uh, I don't see any hands. Uh, it's oh, ah, plenty, one final. Ha okay, we have time for one more question, and this will be a quick question, and Very then the briefly, final answers. May, uh, perhaps I'm ignorant, but uh, I've heard nothing about the elephant in the room, whom I consider Vladimir Putin. We've been talking <laughs> about Trump. Well, uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, yeah who was visiting Budapest last week for the World Championships Judo. Uh, she said, you should look at the amount of big sports events that are taking place in Budapest nowadays. It's very interesting to see how diplomacy and sports come together. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it, it is an elephant in the room, uh, not only for Crimea. The fact that uh, NATO is constantly doing exercises in the Baltic states. Uh, the very complex relationship we have now with Poland. Poland that is very Eurosceptic, that feels that we're touching their sovereignty, but that needs to be protected uh, against uh, Putin. There's one thing that, uh, that, this, that, there's one big thing that distinguishes Hungary from Poland, and that is their uh, appreciation of, uh, of, of Putin. Uh, Poland is, and uh, Poland is not, and, uh, and, uh, and Hungary is. And I think on, I changed my views on defense in the European Union. I come from a political party that always thinks we can cut defense funding. We changed our views here, and it has everything to do uh, with what's going on in Russia. You're right, it's an elephant in the room. But it's such a, it's such a obvious case of dictatorship that what else is new? <laughs> yeah, I can understand that, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. I don't know if you have a final word, Brody. Um, are you going to be writing a book about Russia? Um, are you going <laughs> to be writing? Yeah. No. Well, I'm writing a book, but if I ever get around to it, but about some, about some of my experiences fighting for justice. But yeah. Okay. Very nice. So we have that to look forward to. <laughs> yeah. I I think uh, that uh, and I think also what what I was thinking about when we were talking about the the ICC and a number of you know uh, in terms of looking at you know, decades of work that you've been doing and the question that's come back about the problem of political will, uh, the problem of how little has been accomplished relative to the vast amount that's left to be done. Um, I think what's also important to remember is just that this is a multi-generational thing. And we have people in the room who are quite senior. We have people in the room who are quite young. Um, and I think that's some of the, I don't hear that discussed enough about how is it that you transmit this from one generation to the next. And I think that both of you are playing a very vital role in that. So I want to thank you very much for being here, Judith Sardentini, Reed Brody. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the organizers of this night of dictatorship and bringing dictatorship to justice. Um, and I want to mention, I know there's a film after this, right? Is it um, Ash and Money that's going to start in about 10 minutes? Uh, and then Tim, I think, can sort of round everything up. Yes, so for all the people who were in the it, it, we tried to go to the saloon and it was a bit too full. Um, we have the film screening at the film hall, but if it's too busy, we also screen it in the salon. So if it's too busy there, you can go there. And I think um, the reason we chose this film is I think because it brings some lines together about what we've been discussing, namely how easy it can be for someone with populist rhetoric to gain a base and how difficult it might be to shrug the democratic institutions off. And at the same time, it's a bit...
frightening, but at the same time it gives a bit hope because uh, democratic institutions do fight back. Um, and I think that's also what you are trying to do with the European Union and Hungary now. So I'd like to thank Marco Valenta, Reed Brody and Judith Sargentini. Give them a warm hand. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And for those who go to the film, it's on the on that side of the hall. And for those who want to drink a beer, well, you, uh, you, you've been there in the break, so I think you know where it is. Have a good night, and uh, we'll see you later. Thank you. Bye.